is in America, the big regular textbook, almost all the readings have to be from America, I'll specifically say Zim. But chapter four is crazy big. It's got everything from mercantilism all the way through the events of the Revolution War, it finishes with the Declaration of Independence. They pack way too much in that chapter. But you know, that's why. Yes. Nope, it's just the reading, but I gave you that bookmark already. Remember a little sheet of paper with the terms? For chapter three, we took a quiz on those. Yeah. Yeah. You look at me, I have no idea. Do you? Not even the remotest clue what I'm talking about. You might have been gone? I have extras, but I was I will put it on keys and stuff on my weapon. Okay. I already gave them to you. He just didn't. I already gave the chapter three, four, and five are in that one. All right. So be on Thursday. So we do a quiz. We've done like eight to ten question one, just like the one we had yesterday. I make the reading quizzes very easy, easily and easy. That is my plan. And. We got to talk a little bit about cutting off ears. So where do we finish? Oh, the fur trade. So did we get to King Philip's War? Yeah. 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 We the last slide was the French and the tribal allies. Oh. Really? Last thing I have in here is worldwide. So did we get the ambush? We get yeah. the. Yeah. Oh, so we're here? Yeah. Oh, good. All right. Hey, cool. We're a little bit ahead of first for good. First year. First draft. Well, let's not go that far. But this class, too, you're one of the best classes I've ever had. I mean, I, I don't know how to I'm not even tired of this. Because this is it. It will never get better. And I would never say that to another class. Never. No way would I have ever done that. Yeah. How dare you imply that I have some kind of self-interest with this? That's, a, that's what a self-interested person would say. Huh? All right, that's what they say. Them. All right, so if we get the fur trade, I better try to relate you down as many. Oh, let's, let's backtrack then. King Philip's War. How did the English, how did Massachusetts win that war? Yeah, they slaughtered them at a peace conference after they had lost. And... What was the uh, religious upheaval, upheaval, all the revivals of the 1730s? And what two new religions came out of that? Methodism. Yeah, Methodist and Baptist. And it was definitely different, more emotional. Oh, what do they call those ministers who you pull their, yeah, the charismatic, you know, those revivals, pull them all together. Still used today. It's not used as much. Yeah, I think it's a very good term. It really does fit well. And so let's get to the wars for empire. It all stemming from the fur trade, etc. And so there's going to be a whole series of wars. And the wars are named, I'm giving you the colonial name. This is the name in the colonies. We had King Philip's War. And there's little bits of fighting all along. Did I say King Philip? King, we had King Philip's War, then we had King, King William's War. And what happened was this. In England. 1689, there was a, it's called the Glorious Revolution. You won't need to know this. I'm just, I'm just giving you a little background right now. There was called the Glorious Revolution. The becoming more and more Catholic King of England, King James II was overthrown in a short but bloody civil war. Well, they now they had to find some relative who's Protestant. Well, William's sister was married to the King of the Netherlands, who's Protestant, King William. There's William in there. And that's how, that's how King William became king of both the Netherlands and Britain. The Netherlands were at war with France. So guess who went to war with France all of a sudden? And that would be, so it started in Europe, but that would be the war in the colonies. But it's going to be in the Med, all over the Mediterranean. They'll be fighting in India. They'll be fighting in the Caribbean. Now, do not write this down unless you want to, but don't. It actually, the war in Europe is everybody's favorite, favorite Augsburg related war, the War of the League of Augsburg. I mean, most of you are like so tired of Augsburg's related war. This one, yeah. 
there's a whole series of wars. Louis the Fourteenth was trying to conquer area for his empire. Bloody war here, relatively inconclusive. There'd be a, a, a French invasion of mostly them and their allies, Huron, uh, other tribes. But uh, the British tried to attack up here with colonial militia. But when the war ended in Europe, they signed basically a draw of the colonies. It went back to the status quo. Status quo, another Latin term. Boy, I'm just filling you up with Latin terms. We had terra nullius, and now status quo. Back to the way it was. Keep things the same. So even though it's fighting, there's no real change between the British and the French. Now that doesn't change what's happening along the frontier. There's fighting here, fighting down Lake Champlain, and the tribes who live there are fighting for their lives. It's a desperation for them. The colonists along the frontier, therefore, are fighting for their lives. But to the British and French, eh, we just keep our lives. But they're the British and the French. So there'll be another war. William and Mary didn't have an heir. Uh, they didn't have an heir. So it went to Mary's sister. By the way, after this, it's called the English Bill of Rights. They would say that every English monarch has to be Protestant. And that's the way they said it. Has to be Protestant, period. Queen Anne's War. And in Europe, this actually started another one. You do not need to know the War of the Spanish Spanish Succession. I just put it up there. To, to it up. And this was actually a bloody war between the next monarch of Spain. And Spain was so rich, and by this time they are in, in steep decline. So Queen Anne, this would be in the colonies, and same deal, fighting along here, fighting for this area here, which controlled the mouth of St. Lawrence all part of New France, as you know. And so this war, the overall war was actually a British victory, but for the colonies, another colonial status quo. Now, poor Queen Anne, she tried her best to do the number one role of a monarch. Their number one job, have an heir. That's their number one job. She would be pregnant 17 times, and not one would be on the able one. Most were stillborn. One of the three childbirths at this time ended with the death of her mother. And this is really risky. That's why, oh, and then most, and then a significant number of children didn't make it past one. Whenever you see life expectancy, and they show life expectancy at this era, they'll say, you it was only 37, or something like that. No, it's not that people died at 37, it's just that so many children didn't make it to one. So many mothers died in childbirth, that brought the age down. Most people, especially men, if they got to 20, probably lived to their 70s. They just had to get past one. But that's also why there were more men than women at that time, because of childbirth. With better health care, that's how come the women childbirth is still, still dangerous, but it's not as and so that's an outcome that's more women. That's she it drove her nuts. She went crazy. The pain, constant pain of this, and never been out of a child. And she, yeah, slowly went crazy. It's the only way to describe it. She kept a rabbit. Each child was that going to be that represent the baby? And she did for the first couple, and then it became pretty soon she's surrounded by 17 rabbits, and just a constant reminder of this. So this is actually a really sad story. No heir. The closest heir, Catholic. So they found this little principality, little kingdom in what is now Germany, around the city of Hanover, and they were cousins, and they're Protestant. So the king of Hanover became the king of Germany. And this would begin a series of, for the next, not that long, 300 years, of English, the King of Britain will be German. King Charles, right now, German. German ancestry. They're all Germans. And so, but they're Protestant. Next war, the War of Jenkins' Ear. 
So this is Britain versus Spain. The, the French joined in a little bit. They don't like the Spanish, but hate the British more. And it started actually way back in 1731. So Jenkins was, Robert Jenkins was a commander of a sloop. A sloop would be a relatively small sailing vessel compared to one of their, they're called ships of the line, but think of like battleship. They carried between 10 and 14 guns. They're just fast moving little patrol ships. Patrol for pirates, uh, escort ships. Jenkins was patrolling here near Cuba. That's still a Spanish colony. Now, Spain is in decline. They still have ships carrying whatever, gold or resources, sugar, whatever. And Jenkins was doing a little bit of freelancing that a lot of the Royal Navy, a lot of captains did. Technically, he's a commander of a Royal Navy vessel and he's looking for pirates, but he would also freelance as a, guess what? Pirate. It was really common, and then also smuggle too. And they would find there's a lone Spanish ship. No one's around. I'll take it. And so if they saw a Spanish ship, it was really common. They would quick, even if, if they might not have been flying their ensign. This is where flags come from, obviously, for ships. It makes sense when you get ships. And the Union Jack was the flyer. So the Union Jack had been the flyer for about well, for 30 years now, this flag. But you got to admit, it is a pretty cool one. They'd see a Spanish ship, take down the, the uh, Union Jack, and put up what flag? Spanish. We're your friends! Hi! And then when you get close enough where that ship can't go away, those small, oh, those, these small ships go a lot faster than the Spanish galley supply ship for the uh, freighters. Then they put up a black flag, sometimes fall and cross ones. They didn't have those. And they, whatever they had on board. Well, he was actually doing his little patrolling, pirating, and two Spanish frigates, a little bit bigger ships, caught him right off here. And they got Jenkins, and they knew he was a smuggler and a pirate. They knew it. And they confronted him with this, and Jenkins said something like, um, you go tell your king that I am not a smuggler or a pirate. And they said, well, we'll prove it. And the quick sword strike, cut the right ear off. Ear went flying. They, they actually took everything from Jenkins' ear. Jenkins picked up that ear and saved it. For five years, he held on to that ear. That was one plucky ear. It even made it back to Parliament. And back in, and then in 1738, they were having a conflict over Brit, uh, Britain and Spain. Britain was actually looking for an excuse to cut off, cut off the pirates, but also capture some more land here. And so somebody brought in Jenkins to speak. And he came in, big scar right here, and in the jar was an ear. And he had this, okay, it wasn't really looking like an ear by then, it was kind of a gray cauliflower looking thing. And they pulled this, had this ear out, and he said, unprovoked, for no reason at all. He was a pirate, but for no reason at all, they cut my ear off. And heck, for pirates, it, was, it could have executed him. And they said, oh my goodness, look at that. They reached in and pulled the ear out of the jar, and they passed it around. Look at this thing, look at it. Here's, this is the picture, that's the ear right there. How dare they, one of our noble Royal Navy officers, and use that as an excuse to go to war. So another slight British victory, another war. So I went to Parliament, I, uh, the first time I was in London, so that must have been 2004. Years start blending together, just go with me, sometime a while ago. And I went to go to Parliament, my wife and I uh, went there, now it's a lot easier. You go online, you get time, you go. Back then you just wait in line, it's first come, first serve. And we're waiting there, and we waited in line for two and a half hours. And imagine all of you have been in something like this. We're about half hour, and like, let's see, if the line starts moving, we'll, we'll wait, you know, we'll go. And then after you wait in line for an hour, it's like, well, we spent this much time, we can't leave now. And we just sat there. Well, finally we got in, waiting in line to go to the observation booth. I'm glad I went, but it was a long way. And there was this long, the problem was huge, was the building. This long hallway with just a line of us, you know, tired people standing there. And they had a bunch of little exhibits. It's basically just like a, you know, these, this, these glass doors that had a, you know, like there was a pin that was signed by something. 
Most of them are like, no, I'm not interested. And I'm standing in line, I look over, and there was a jar right there with an ear. Right next to me. It was Jenkins' ear sitting right there. Ear. Well, there's signs all over, don't take a picture. But I thought, I'm going to get a picture. And I did, did one of the CD cards, and I pulled my camera, and I got it right to here, and it just and they're like, out of nowhere, this guy came. Just look at him. So I didn't get a picture of him. I got the ear instead. So this was, I would argue, my favorite ear-related one. You with me on that? We'll get to the other ear-related wars later. So, next war. I forgot to put the year 1741 to 1744 in the colonies. It's King George's War. You don't need to know Austrian secession, but that's how it started there. But king of Hubi, Hubi the king of Spain, now who will be the king of Austria? They picked Marie Theresa, a long story. The colonists actually won. Colonial uh, militia took the really important French fort of Louisbourg. The French really didn't have a garrison by much. 41 to 44. Here's Louisbourg. You can see why that's so important because it's going into the St. Lawrence River. Well, this was another one of those status quo treaties, though. Even though like, the war of Spanish secession was your British victory, and the colonies, they just said, we're going to go back to the White Woods, and the British had to give up that fort. Now, status quo antebellum, I wrote the whole thing out. The way it was, anybody know what this means? Antebellum. Bellum is war. And the way it was before the war. Status quo antebellum. And the thing about antebellum, in American history, they refer to the era before the Civil War as the antebellum period. Now, this has become awkward because people seem to think that refers to slavery, and I know names become you know, the hells of slavery, and names become like associated with it, but all antebellum means is just before the war. But another one to, to go back. But here's the thing about this. The French are terrified. It's 10 to 1 colonists, 10 times more English colonists than French colonists. And every day, more people are going to the English colonies. The Quebec was a pretty big city. Montreal was growing. But other than that, there was a few scattered places here. New Orleans was a French town. That was fairly big. St. Louis was just a, a little tiny uh, wooden stockade. And the French were desperate to hold on to this. But the English, there's more of them. And the English had reached the Appalachian Mountains. Next, the Royal Navy was becoming the most powerful fleet in the world over that 100 years. Island nation, it kind of makes sense to be better at seamanship, but also, therefore, the French had a difficult time getting supplies. They knew that it's hard, they're, they, they're open to blockade. And lastly, since the French know they're in trouble, more and more they're thinking, if the time is right, we might have to strike first. Because we know someday, we just know it, someday in the future, the British will take us. That's called a preventative war. Now, you might have heard of a preemptive strike. A preemptive strike is like, you know, their armies are massing on the border. You know they're coming, for sure. And so you strike before they do it. Preventative, no, you just, you're convinced someday they're going to get you. Now, the problem with that is most of us probably cannot read the future. Can anyone here, do they know the future? Anyone? Anyone? Let's talk like lottery numbers. All right, we'll talk about this. You can read the future. None of you in here? All right. Couldn't you say this about any war? What was the reason Vladimir Putin, the dictator of Russia, gave for attacking Ukraine? They wanted to get him to kill. Say it again? Well, there's issues there, but what was his reason for? Like to reunite the old Russians? We said he reunited the old Russian, but his issue was NATO, the alliance in Western Europe, was going to make Ukraine an ally and therefore surround Russians. 
Was that going to happen? No. No, NATO, Ukraine's pretty corrupt. NATO wasn't going to let him in. But he used he can use a preventative strike as an excuse. The South started the Civil War. The Confederacy used to see. Everyone knew. Everybody knew that was war. Because someday, the North and the new Republican Party were going to destroy the system of slavery. Going to isolate them, condemn them to the slave rebellion. They knew it. Germany would start Armageddon. World War One, because they're going to be surrounded by enemies, and someday, so this is pretty risky. The French were going to roll the dice for something they have no idea what's going to happen. We can guess the future. You look at the past events and read the future. I should add, if you don't know past events, the people who do will cheat you and steal from you and take from you. People like me. I wouldn't do it, but I could. So there's the French problem. And that's going to lead to the French and Indian War. Unlike the other wars, the French and Indian War started in the Americas. All the previous ones we mentioned, for whatever reason, started outside the colonies. This one started in what is now Pennsylvania. It would begin, or uh, two years later, it would rage in Europe as the very cleverly named Seven Years War. I should add, this is not that French and Indians were fighting. This was English colonists in England were fighting the French and their Indian allies, their American Indian allies. Does that make sense? That's where that term comes from. So, here, the, oh. The French problem is still the same. The colonies already realize they have a problem, though. There are 13 bitterly divided colonies. They don't like each other. And this was shown time after time. We tried to deal with the various tribes, deal with the French, or at war. They were bitterly divided. So there was a proposal called the Albany Plan of Union, where the colonies would get together. And it was proposed by a man who's becoming one of the most famous men, not just in the colonies, but in the world, Benjamin Franklin. He wrote a book called Poor Franklin's Almanac. He was a very famous printer. He was a very intelligent man, very clever, good at selling himself. And he proposed a loose confederacy of the 13 colonies. Now, confederacy is technically not one unified, like one country as we might think of, like for the most part, the United States. It is 13 relatively independent states, colonies, whatever it might be, who have an agreement to cooperate, but not an ironclad government. Canada kind of started like this, for example. So it's going to be based upon the Iroquois. If you wrote the Iroquois on the map. We don't have time to talk about it in great detail. But they had a confederacy versus the five and then six tribes right here. And they actually were complaining to the colonists all the time. We have no one to talk to. Iroquois hated the Huron and other tribes, the Ottawa. The tribes are allied to the French. And so they wanted British support. It failed. The colonists just didn't like each other. Now you might be wondering, why am I talking about this failed event? Well, it shows a couple things. First off, there was this idea that these 13 colonies isolated will forever be weak colonies in this mercantile system and never really be strong enough to go out on their own. But here's the big reason. 1754, on the edge of war with France, they couldn't talk. They hated each other. Ten years later, the 13 colonies would put a conference together of representatives to jointly attack the policy of the country. country. They unified together a decade later. Everything changed. 1754, we hate each other. 1764, 1765, the British passed something called the Stamp Act. And now, we don't like Virginia, we don't like the other colonies, but we hate the British more. So it showed that the British policy is going to bring these countries, these colonies together. So that, where it all started, was the Ohio River Valley. 
the Ohio River right here. It's the fur trade. And they knew all the English colonies and Britain itself, itself knew the French are eyeing this. The French have a claim. And the French want to get here. They don't have enough colonists, but if they can build forts along this line, they can hold their colony. But this has, this is the first thing, fur. What happened to the beaver on this side of the Appalachian Mountains? They're pretty much gone. So if they can get over the Appalachian Mountains, they have the fur trade first. But then let's get to the next thing. There's all this land. That's why they went there to get the land. There were plantation owners one land. And they heard, and there's people who have been there, broad plain, fertile, forest, but also great for farming. This is going to be unreal. As it turned out, it wasn't great for tobacco. That far north, there's tobacco a little bit more down here. But still, everything they might want. All this land. And Britain and France had a plan. Both of them did. So it's a race. The French were the Bill of Force. The British, but when I say the British, I mean London. London has a plan. So in London, they're thinking, let's build a colony there. But don't forget, all the colonies have a claim too. Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York all claim it. No, you don't need to know that. But the point is, all these other colonies, if it's going to be that lucrative, Virginia doesn't want it to be a separate British colony, Ohio, whatever it might be. They want this to be Virginia colony. Pennsylvania wants it for Pennsylvania. So there's a race between the colonies the British itself from London and France. And stuck in the middle are these various tribes. But nobody wants it more, nobody's more desperate than the plantation owners of Virginia. This map, this is a cool map. It, it's a little darker than I hoped. That's a map from 1754. Isn't that map pretty good? And they did a good job. No plane, they had to be great cartographers. But tobacco, there had been more tobacco in, more tobacco being grown than ever before by the 70s. Virginia, North Carolina was good tobacco ground. North Carolina turned out to be better than Virginia. But there's something else too. Virginia, latitude. Uh, it's Turkey today, then it was the Ottoman Empire. And they started growing turkey. Did I say growing turkey? Yeah, they, they grew turkey. They started growing tobacco too. If a bunch of tobacco goes, more tobacco than ever before goes into the market, the price drops. The price drops. I mean, we're, seeing, we're seeing that right now. Six months ago, there was a, a lot more oil than there had been for uh, in a long time on the market prices. Went down pretty dramatically. Now what are prices now? Why can Saudi Arabia has dramatically cut back oil production? So worldwide, there's us oil, that means prices here are going down, even though the US doesn't buy hardly any oil at all in Saudi Arabia, but in the worldwide market. Same thing's happening here. And don't forget, the soil they're using up. So these plantation owners are getting desperate. They want more land, they're obsessed by it. Their profits are going down and every farmer is in what? Debt. They gotta pay back their debt. Almost all of it to British merchants across the Atlantic. There's no banks yet, no banks, and they're all in debt. And then, what about the second or third sons of these plantation owners? Do the first sons are gonna get the main plot, what do they get? And if it's a small plantation, they might they might get nothing. Medium size, they, they will the second son will get you know the swampy land that's used up, they can't grow much. And who gets the human laborers? 
Indians. A lot of welfare. But if they could get land over the Appalachian Mountains. And I should add one more thing. The Appalachian Mountains was a wall. Has anyone ever been to the Appalachians? They're really pretty. You know, it, there, it's greener there. You know, there's running water. I like running water. So it's really nice. But they're a lot older than the Rocky Mountains. So the Rocky Mountains, you have these peaks and valleys. Yes, it could be a wall too, but it's different. The Appalachian, it's like long lines. So they go like north to south, long lines. And so it's a wall. If there's no roads, you come to that and it's hard to get over. And so the English are up against this. It's going to be a major move to get over that Appalachian Mountains, over that hump. If you ever get a chance, or if you have flown, let's say to New York City, and someplace on the East Coast and fly out the Appalachian Mountains, and if you can look out the window, do at the Appalachians. It's really weird. I mean, it really is just a, a line, and then another line, and then another line. One more thing, speculation. And I wrote speculation up here. This is one of the most important words. You have to know this. And not just for class. Obviously, you have to know it for class, but this is kind of the basis of our economy. Speculation. Anybody know what this means in the financial sense? Go ahead. Okay, on the right track. You can pass like what Frank said now because they're anticipating what could happen or something that is going to happen. So it impacts prices now because they're trying to anticipate it. You're on the right track, but even a more basic term for speculation about let's say a farmer sitting the second or third sense in there, I'm like, I want to get this far. You're on the right track, but it is speculation looking at advance. But in the financial sense, it's speculating in this market. This is the real estate market for land. Why do people buy stocks? It's going to come to me. You're hoping and or speculating the value goes up. What do they, if you believe in speculation, you want to buy something when the price is what? And then do what? So you're hoping that the price will go up. If the price will go down, it's not a good time to buy. It's a good time to do what? So speculation means buy low, sell high. You're hoping, you're gambling that the price is up. Now, you might look at past events and see, okay, the price will go up. Or you could just be rolling the dice in a big casino, aka the stock market and hoping the price goes up. This is the basis of the economy. So much of why the United States is here is buy low, sell high. Let's say Virginia gets the claim to the Ohio River Valley. And so all of a sudden it opens it up to settlement. From we can't settle there to all these people like, there's land I can take. What's gonna happen to the price of that land? Skyrocket, because everybody's gonna want it. So do you see the advantage if you can be the first one there to lay claim, the price will be low. Get that land claim first and then sell out punks and make a profit. If you're the second set of a medium sized plantation owner, you're probably not gonna get much of inheritance. But if you can get this land here first, sell it, boom, we're rich. Speculation. There's going to be real, real estate speculation time after time after time after time after time in our history. We see it in Montana right now. What do you think is happening in Bozeman? Especially the fact that Montana has changed its tax laws to make it significantly easier for wealthy people from out of state to buy up land in Montana. That's the goal of the current government of Montana, to get wealthy people from out of state to buy land. And what does that do to the price of land in Montana? What's happening in Bozeman? As now people are speculating around Bozeman. If you, if you don't have much money, you don't have a place to live. In fact, I just read an article in Bozeman about how uh, uh, there's having the, a problem all the people having to live in their RVs because they just have no place to live. Yeah, you do. But buy for sell. That's speculation. That's why people buy in the stock market. Wouldn't make sense to them, but 
five well so hot. They're speculative. They're gambling. It's a big casino. We will come back to speculation. So, 1754, Virginia tried to get here first. And they picked a very young and ambitious, not a lieutenant colonel, he was a major in the militia, a young man, very ambitious, that's not, that's not strong enough of a word, as a major, George Washington, the second son of a medium-sized plantation owner, he had been to the mouth of the Ohio a year earlier. And he suggests that he takes a small mission and he'll build a fort there before the British, but just as important, before Pennsylvania Colony, New York, New Jersey, or from London. He'll get there first. Washington was very intelligent. Now, he didn't have the classical uh, education of an English gentleman, but he was ambitious. He wanted, in fact, Washington wanted three things. Three things. Are you ready for these three things? to be rich, to be really rich, to be super rich. Number two, he wanted to be an English country gentleman. Remember I told you they all kind of went there, they wanted that. In fact, he was kind of hoping to get an estate back in England. That's what he really wanted to do. Boy, and uh, thirdly, an officer in the English army. That's all he wanted, three pretty, pretty big things. I just want to be the richest person in the colony. What's the big deal? He had a little tiny inheritance from his father. Swampy land. He also uh, bought 25 swamps. So his inheritance were 25 humans and bad land. And he wanted more. More, more, more. Oh, I have to be very clear. He knew slavery was wrong. But he wanted money. Money, slaves, money. I should add, Washington did some very good and noble things that we should all be very proud of as an American. And also, I'm not going to lie, things that you are very bad. People do good and bad things. We can't judge him on, on the good or the bad things now because he's dead. But we can learn from that. Doesn't mean we should not acknowledge the good things, but we also have acknowledge what the situation was. And one more thing, and I'll say this again, down the road, you could do things that are fully selfish for your own personal interest and gain. It could be wealth or prestige, power or fame. That could also do good things for other people. <coughs> Life is complex out there. We're all good and only care about each other, right? But out there, People sometimes are complex. Washington, complex. So, you get about 200 or so, um, or a few hundred militia, maybe up to 200 Mingos. Mingos was a tribe right on the Appalachian Mountains who had basically thrown their lot in with Virginia because they had lost everything else. And they were told you you would get a lot of prize if you went there. And they, Took my boat up to Alexandria, which is on the Potomac, right after the Al Alexandria, the Potomac turns into waterfalls and rapids. If you ever get a chance to go to Washington, D.C., just go a little bit west on the Potomac, and it's some of the most beautiful rapids and waterfalls you've ever seen. And it just it's right next to Washington, D.C. It's really cool. That's as far as they go by boat. And then they took off walking. Now, I want you to ponder that for a second. They knew what they were gonna do. Okay, we're just now gonna walk 200 mile, miles over a mountain, cutting a road, more like a trail. They went through by axes and hatches through the thick forest, and think about why this mile. Enough for two men to march or a pack out. But they took off 200 miles, gone. So they were kind of a different breed back then. That was just the norm. We're going to take off walking for a mile. Of course, well, what else are you going to do? I mean, people today whine if they have to cross the street and don't get a ride. But then, by um, they were tough. That was a tougher generation. As I like to say, that was my generation. That's what I could do, too. No, I would whine just as much. So don't forget, these guys were pretty amazing. Now, what they were doing was still land for the people who lived there, but it doesn't take away, away the fact of their toughness. They cut a path through here, 
over, over, sorry, over the mountains, really heavily forest. And when they got near the mouth of the Ohio, they knew they were being watched. Ottawa's had been watching them the whole time. And they got to the mouth of the Ohio River, to Fort, I'll put it up here in a sec, Duquesne. The French had beat them. This is a model there of the fort that's now present day, well, we'll get to that down below, Pennsylvania. It was a star fort. They started making star forts because of the new modern cannon. It was basically a wooden stockade and dirt. But the French had built a fort in Washington. Can you imagine how crestfallen this was? He really thought, because he'd been there a year earlier, it's going to be open. He'll build that little fort, and he could just see the wealth, the prestige, the power. And Britain's going to acknowledge it. He'll, he'll be an English officer. He's going to get everything he wanted. Instead, that, and it all fell apart. What does he do? Yeah. Cry. And then what? No, he couldn't cry, Washington. Look at that. And he had no idea how many French were in there. He knew he's being watched by the French allies, the Ottawa, the Huron, and the other tribe. Well, they're watching him. And so he marches a little bit away to this valley and ponders it. If he goes back, he might lose everything. He's only 21, 22. But he knows the clock is ticking. There's only so much land. If he stays, he knows he can't attack that fort till he knows. And then a small French, not even really a patrol. Think about uh, a few horses, a few Frenchmen, and they. he sees them leave the fort, and they're winding their way. They're actually going up north. What does he do? Hmm? Say it again. No. He attacks them. They're not at war. He starts a war. George Washington starts a war called the French and Indian War. That, that would directly lead to the American independence. That would directly lead to him to become the first president under the new constitution. And that was his plan. I'm going to start a war that will lead to a new country. No, he bumbled his way into a worldwide war. George Washington. It's called the human villain fair. Human Bill is the name of the French officer. The Glen where he captured him is now called Human Bill Glen, part of the National Park Service. And it's, it's really rugged forest, a lot of these um, big rocks. It's a really cool area. He ambushed the French and started a war. A few people were wounded. He captured Jumanville and the others. And then, what did he do? He had no idea. I got Jumanville. Ah. And on that note, we'll finish it off. <laughs> War is coming. And the amazing thing is. It's so weird. He would make, the outcome of this would he become eventually president and the father of a country. It's so wild. On that happy note, have a good day. Goodbye. We'll see you. I care less about the National Guard or about the fact that you shot and then boxing got that shot. Oh, that's great. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. Goodbye. So you came late and then, where were you at again? Oh, just put subway and stuff. Yeah. Not going to go. I literally have all of these lines. Yeah, we're going to get them from, from green to... Green. Okay.
Have you gone on my web page? No, I can probably ask you about the librarians to help me out. Well, here, let me see if I can, if I have an extra copy. Because I've, I've got the, I have the worksheet filled out, and I have the maps that are blank, but I did the maps on my. You did the I maps on my? Yeah. Oh, I can't do that. Yeah, I have to figure out a way. And then do it all in it. Oh, I see what you did. Get them to me. All right. Happy birthday. Got any big plans? Gonna do something big for the weekend? But I do need to go to the bathroom. I like that. Sure. Oh. Very good. Oh, first time I've had some first time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 Uh -huh. And he was still digging through the garbage. Right. So the, the colonel, like, we can make this size a lot. Hey, you need this box. You need to back it up. I'll give you a wagon worth of uh, bullets. Yeah. Well, normally, like, you can just go to the back of the box. And then there's a the visible. Yeah, tell me more. I won't get to that. But God, that sounds just uh, sounds like close to disgusting. All right. I've been sitting here holding on to this stuff. I've been hoarding this for the value to go up. By the way, let me ask you this. This takes place too, right? Yeah. So, your choices are it's going to take two minutes. So, today at lunch or tomorrow at lunch? You, you're responsible to remind me. If you don't, then you get what grade will you get? A negative thousand. Oh. I don't make the rules. That came. I'm, all right. So, I'm hanging, I've been holding on to this stuff. What do you call if you buy something and the price is low? And you hope the price will go up and then sell it. It's the basis of our economy. You know what that's called? Well, investment a form of this. We will come back to this. It's called speculation. We'll talk about that today. I was holding on to this, hoping the value would go up and they could sell it to people. As it turned out, they didn't want it. Can you believe that? So, the Zen is worth. 12 points piece, three points a question. By the way, the Zen people did really well on that. Did very well on that. But uh, the only time I took points off about the wedge that was between the um, forward interest service and the slave, I wanted something about law, the change of laws and wrote those laws. That was the only thing I was looking for, so I might take a point off here and there. Unless you didn't really answer it, then I think more points off. That happens. 